for treatment plant yep. recovery okay. update. Uh, kia ora koutou, councillors. Um, I've got the team here to give you um, the second of what is a, going to be fortnightly updates to this council and to the Finance and Performance Committee. Um, and I just wanted to just absolutely clarify, so the report that you have in the agenda is a summary of what we presented two weeks ago. Um, and the presentation will cover what has happened over the last two weeks. And that will be the pattern of reporting um, for the period that we'll be reporting fortnightly um, to you. Um, and just to um, just to outline, sorry, what we're going to cover this morning. Um, we will talk to you about the contract, which, um, as you know, was um, awarded yesterday. Um, so we will talk you through um, what's happening with that contract, what was going to happen over the next four months, um, and also we'll talk to you about what activities have led up to that awarding of the contract um, since the time that the insurer gave us the nod to go ahead and remove the filter material. Um, we'll give you an update on what's ha been happening with the wider plant. Um, so Adam will talk to you um, again about what we're doing with the wider plant. Um, and we'll update you on the environmental moderate, mo um, monitoring, particularly the odour monitoring um, and our partnership with other parties on that. We'll give you um, an update on community support in terms of the next steps and in, in decision making there and what, um, what's happening with communication. So I will hand over to um, Michael um, now to talk you through the, um, the contract to remove the material. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Um, as you know, the letter of acceptance for the contract to remove the media from the trickling filters was, uh, was sent to Southern Demolition and Salvage Limited uh, yesterday morning, um, and the appointment was made public yesterday afternoon. Uh, site establishment is underway. Uh, the first of the machinery started arriving on site this morning, so there's a lovely image up there of uh, that was taken quite early this morning of an excavator on site. Um, uh, for the rest of the day, they'll obviously be delivering uh, more plant or machinery to site. Uh, this will include uh, compact, well, over the next four weeks, compactors, chippers, the establishment of concrete pads that place those units on, um, and sheet piling, obviously. Um, media removal work is uh, scheduled to start uh, Queen's, well, after Queen's birthday, so 6th of June. Um, the methodology on how they're removing that media is they'll be constructing uh, two um, stone ramps uh, to so the excavator can gain access to the top of the uh, trickling filters to start removing that media. Uh, once they've excavated a sizable enough patch, a smaller digger will be, um, or excavator will be lowered in um, and it will continue moving uh, media to the larger excavator so it can be uh, taken out of the trickling filters. Um, so the completion of the media removal, so that's not completion of the contract, but completion of the media removal will be completed uh, early spring. So within the first week of uh, September. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of uh, what's happened over the last, I guess, six and a half weeks from when our insurer first notified us that we could commence or start to remove that media, um, there has been a lot of work happen over that last six and a half weeks. Um, from the public's point of view, it may look like it was moving slowly, but there has been a hell of a lot of work done. Um, so the first thing that was done was our procurement uh, options were thoroughly investigated and confirmed, so we had to make sure our procurement uh, methodology uh, was in line with the Council's procurement policy and also that we matched uh, the best guidance notes from uh, Office of the Auditor General. Uh, we met with the contractor initially uh, to talk through what we were um, planning to have done. Contractor then went out and organised uh, labour resources and supply, uh, secure supply lines. Um, and also undertook discussions with uh, Cape Valley for the disposal of the uh, filter media because it is a, a classed as a hazardous substance. Uh, contract documentation was being prepared by council staff while the contractor was securing subbies and those supply lines. Uh, presentation was then given to the Finance and Performance Committee. Uh, contractor's uh, proposal was received by council staff. Uh, contract terms and conditions were then finalised with the contractor. Um, and the insurance sub subcommittee were provided with a briefing following that. Um, and then obviously the last step was the uh, letter of issue of award was uh, sent out uh, yesterday morning. 
on the RSC Adam to come forward and give you an update on the operational interim operational procedures of the plant. Good morning. Uh, just to give you an update on what we have done over the previous two weeks operationally on the wastewater treatment plant. The first image you'll see in front of you is the two um, temporary aeration tanks. Um, both of these tanks have been fully online for the past two weeks, um, treating the sewage that's been passing through them. Prior to this, the tanks were offline, with just the aerators being operated um, to test them during commissioning. Um, also indicated that image, we've made minor operational tweaks. So at the bottom, you'll see some strapping lines. These are to hold the arms, which previously rotated, to hold them into position, because we found they were vibrating an awful lot and we don't want to damage them. And in the center, we've taken some of the mechanical parts apart, which are not going to be used while the system's in place, so we can take it, service it, and store it, ready for it to be returned to service when the system's finally decommissioned. This image shows the other ongoing work that's happening on these temporary aeration tanks. In the bottom, you can see all the electrical conduits for all the electrical wiring for these aerators going in. On the right hand side, apologies, the image isn't quite as good as what I hope it is, is one of the transformers. Um, that's the little gray box. And the top arrow is the control cabinets for all the controls that are going in there. Moving on to the oxidation ponds, um, this image shows the two additional surface aerators which have been installed. As you can see, it's not just as easy as just putting the surface aerator in. We've got to make sure the surface aerator's in, it's in the right place, it's anchored, um, it's not going to try and drive itself away, and it's got the electrical controls connected all in place. So they are now both in an operational on oxidation pond one. The first surface aerator that we put in on oxidation pond one, this was just further down to the south, um, that has been requested to be returned to the organisation that's lent it to us. So that is isolated and that has now been taken out, um, will obviously be cleaned before being returned to them. Um, it is not perceived for the loss of this aerator to have any significant impact given that the other two aerators have gone in. As you're aware, we are putting in a trickling filter bypass pipe. Um, this photograph on the right shows the trench that's gone through. Um, the yellow arrow at the top indicates where we temporarily have to keep the trench covered to put some heavy steel plates in. This isn't to enable us to carry on with the normal operation and maintenance of the grit removal system. So we've had some excellent cooperation with the contractor to make sure other normal site operations can continue whilst we put this great big trench all the way through. The white arrows in the foreground show the existing underground services that a contractor's having to work around. So you can see fairly significant pipes and conduits go through. And there's also the site 11,000 KVA ring main, which also runs through this area. So I can confirm that has been isolated as of this morning. When you are trying to build the second largest um, wastewater treatment system in New Zealand, it doesn't come with a nice operation and maintenance manual. Um, so what my site staff have been busy in doing in the background is to prepare all the associated documentation, health and safety protocols for how to operate this system when it's in. So this is just a, a, an example of that. So on the right hand side, um, you can see the standard operating procedure for the daily checklist for the site. So that documents all the process of procedures, the health and safety requirements. And on the left is um, the appendix to that, which is the daily check sheet, which the operators work around. So as you can see, this is already in and we're working through it on a daily basis. And you can see the number of amendments and notes which has been made on those, which will then be incorporated into the main document to um, make it fit for purpose and continue to keep the site as performing as well as possible. Um, we've also taken the steps of establishing an operational laboratory for the site staff. So the Christchurch Wastewater Treatment Plant already has a fully accredited IENS laboratory. However, that focuses on three areas, water, wastewater and stormwater and other environmental monitoring. As a consequence of that, when we send the samples into the lab, the response time from the lab is anything from one day for a simple pH test to five days for where they have to do some analysis on the sludge. 
what this little setup will do is enables my site operational staff to grab some samples and do instant analysis on it, get the results back within 15 minutes, a couple of hours if they have to dry a sample out, and then they can go straight back out and grab some more samples or make some operational changes straight away. On the left hand side is a list of all the equipment that's been purchased that the staff are rapidly making themselves familiar with to make sure they can all use it and understand it in a consistent manner. Um, I appreciate it looks a bit piecemeal on the right hand side. Um, we're just waiting for the bench to be installed into it so the, the site staff are operating it in a, in a nice safe environment. To ensure the reliability of this new system, we will be working the system hard and it will be working at full capacity. The amount of redundancy and resilience in this new system, um, there's not a lot of. Um, to ensure we can operate it as reliably as possible, what we've done is we've fast-tracked the, the um, replacement of the site's telehandler. This is always scheduled to be replaced anyway. All I'm doing is bringing it, more, bringing it forward because it's had a um, bit of a history of unreliability. Prior to this, it didn't matter if it broke down for a couple of days. Um, however, in this, we need to be able to get in and lift those surface aerators out and get it replaced as quickly as possible within a matter of hours. I'm breaking the rule, but um, dumb question. What Explain what the tally handler is and what it does. Sorry. So um, on the left-hand side is the is a great big crane. This was used to put the eight aerators in. So to get a crane to site takes a couple of days. On the right-hand side is the tally handler. Is it possible to move the um, remove the people? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so to what the telehandler is, it's um, it's a it's a unit with a great big telescopic arm that can reach up to twenty meters, um, and it can get right up against the tank edge, so we can get across, lift the aerators, and move it across. Spoiler alert though, it looks exactly as you'd imagine it. <laughs> you can switch your cameras back on, sorry. It didn't help. <laughs> So I say it's just a um, small bit of plant. It's got a telescopic arm on it, so we can drive it right up to the um, tank edge, extend the boom, hook it onto the surface aerator, lift it out, put it down, and drop the critical spare one in straight away. So downtime is a matter of hours as opposed to two or three days for the crane. So it's just to make sure we are running this system as quickly and effectively and efficient as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Um, so the next slide is on our air quality monitoring. Nigel. Hi, thanks very much for the opportunity to present. My name's Nigel Grant. So the um, air quality monitoring, we've now, t we've trained up monitoring staff to um, do do the work and we've we've had one round of monitoring that was done by, by a company. We've now got our staff trained up to do that and we've got that scheduled. We'll be doing that weekly from now on. The first first sampling is happening today. Uh, in the weeks moving forward, we'll we'll have more of an eye. We'll just be watching more closely on on weather conditions and perhaps also working with ECAN to see when there's been a, if there's spikes in smell complaints. So we'll be a bit more flexible about the times that we monitor. Uh, the turnaround is expected to be quick, so we should have those the results for this week back by Monday night, I'm hoping, and obviously we'll communicate those out. So, thanks. Uh, there'll be, there's, we're also setting up regular and scheduled meetings with Environment Canterbury and Community and Public Health to ensure that we've got good cross-agency uh, collaboration on public health and environmental issues. Uh, we've had one of those. It's a bit tricky to pull a number of people together, but as well as that, already offline, I've been talking to um, Medical Officer of Health from Community and Public Health and getting a good good line of commu communication going. They're obviously interested in us providing them the results from the ear sampling that we're getting so that they, they, can, they can also have their own specialist advice that they have access to. So that's, that's valuable for us. And in addition to that, 
we're we're also have engaged with an external specialist to once again when we start feeding those results into them um, they'll be able to provide further assessment and advice on those monitoring results and and obviously working closely with Adam's guys who are doing monitoring also and running the plant so that's pretty much for me thanks Nigel um, so we've got Adrian online to talk about the insurance cover hi good morning everyone um, just a, a brief update really on what insurance cover we have over the plant uh, and what we at the time of the fire and going forward. So the, the key thing is the plant was fully insured under our above ground asset policy at the time of the fire. It's still fully insured. We have our insurance renewal due on 30th of June and we've had no indications from insurers that there will be any issues renewing that cover. Um, our policy allows or covers two different um, portions. One is called material damage, which is the physical damage suffered in a fire or an earthquake, a flood, whatever. Um, can you just skip back to the previous slide, please? Um, and under that cover, the trickling filters insured value is approximately 90 million. And that was based on a reinstatement cost and evaluation in June 2021. The second part of the policy is what's known as business interruption. And that is for increased costs of maintaining normal operations once you've had an event like the fire. Um, and then there's also 5 million worth of cover under that business interruption as well for assessing and preparing the claims. So a total insurance available for this particular event is 105 million. You'll all be well aware that we received a $10 million initial payment in late November from the insurer. That was not tagged as being material damage or business interruption. It was simply an interim payment. Uh, internally, we have chosen to classify as increased costs because that's where the bulk of the spend has been so far in transforming the plant to run in the new system that Adam's been um, outlining to you. The material damage portion of the cover also covers the costs of the filter media removal and all the uh, engineering fees to assess the damage and establish what to do to rectify it and what it might cost. Uh, next slide, please, Jane, if you're driving. Um, so the key here is the material damage section of the policy entitles us to receive the cost of reinstatement of the um, asset. So there's two uh, different definitions of reinstatement depending on whether the asset is destroyed or not. Uh, so if it's destroyed, then reinstatement is a replacement with an equivalent building or plant using um, current technology. If it's repairable, uh, then it's the restoration of the damaged part of the asset uh, to a condition substantially the same as we knew, including any alterations or further work needed to comply with any laws. So that's uh, things where, like the building code changes uh, or if we had to do anything to comply with changed environmental laws from the time that the uh, original was put in. The business interruption section of the policy covers any costs that we've incurred resuming or maintaining any normal service or operation is the uh, wording in the policy. So that covers the transformation work Adam and his team have done out at the plant, as well as um, costs of things like the increased chemical dosing that was put in starting the day after the fire and still continuing so that will be um, included under that cover um, 
just checking the notes here, sorry. Uh, and that, yeah, that's basically it from an insurance point of view. I'll be staying online for any questions at the end of the presentation. Thanks, Adrian. So a consultant was uh, appointed uh, in April to undertake uh, future process um, options analysis um, for the capacity recovery of the trickling filters. Um, this report is due in November. Um, the package of work has been broken up into four separate sections. So uh, the consultant has, be, uh, has been asked to look at, um, uh, firstly, to establish a, a baseline or capacity baseline, what, what the plant was uh, capable of treating prior to the fire event. Um, second package is looking at what options are available to uh, replace the trickling uh, capacity of the trickling filters. So they're looking at uh, worldwide for those options. Um, obviously, looking at new technology. Uh, trickling filters are um, 50 years old from when they were first established here. So new technology, our uh, technology uh, has likely moved on, and there could be um, uh, more efficient and um, uh, cheaper options than the trickling filters. So they're looking into that. Um, a third package in that is also investigations into what which of those options would provide best bang for buck in terms of greenhouse gas emissions uh, or reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and then finally, um, uh, they'll be ensuring any of those options will be able to cope with any future um, um, increases in um, treatment capacity that's required through population growth and business growth. Um, we'll also be asking uh, our consultants to uh, investigate um, uh, the likely standards uh, or changes in standards that could come arise in the future for discharging to our water bodies, uh, recognising that the future, um, in the future we may, may not be able to discharge um, uh, wastewater into the ocean. Thanks, Michael. Uh, Katie, will, oh, sorry. Gary. Gary will now just give you a just a. <coughs> Good morning, everybody. Uh, so just a, a quick uh, community support update. So um, council has been invited to the public meeting tomorrow at Bromley. Um, uh, the mayor, um, Councillor Cotter, and staff will be there. Um, Plus myself. And Councillor Johansson. Oh, Councillor Johansson, sorry. A bit hard to hear in today, sorry. Um, and uh, at that point, um, it is a community-led meeting. I'm uh, expecting to hear straight from the community some of the needs that may appear there. Uh, we have some wellbeing workshops uh, run by an independent health provider on those two dates. Um, being held at the Aranui Wainoni Community Centre, um, the centre itself uh, allows for some breakout space should there be a need for that on the night. Uh, and um, we're um, working with partners to have a look at the support options, which I'll bring to you at a briefing on Tuesday um, around community supports out there that we can fund. Thanks, Gary. Now, Katie will talk to you just about what we're doing with communications and what we've been doing over the last couple of weeks and what's coming up. Kia ora koutou. So acknowledging um, that we uh, needed to do more communications earlier on in this process, um, in the last two weeks you can see up there the list of what we have been up to, but of course always our focus is on uh, where true from here. Um, I really appreciated hearing from Don Gould this morning and it was also encouraging to hear um, that uh, the affected community are finding some of the uh, communications that we're putting out uh, to be helpful. So coming up, we have a webinar. Um, we're confirming the exact date of that, likely to be the week commencing 23rd of May. We've got a combined community board presentation that will be um, uh, available for people um, to view, and we are working on that video walkthrough of the plant. And we, of course, have our regular end newsletter and updates on the website. This mention will be going to the, um, the meeting tomorrow night. Thanks, Katie. Um, and in addition to that, we've got um, the weekly um, e-newsletter updates, um, and we are also investigating options for future community meetings, and um, that will be informed by um, tomorrow night's meeting. Um, so just to round off, um, we're also we've now set up a um, a ongoing reporting um, regime to elected members. Um, so all these, or well, most of these will be um, in public. As I said at the beginning, there are fortnightly briefings to um, the council um, and finance performance. 
and that will be just giving you a general update on the activities that we've done the, the last the previous two weeks. We are now going to be doing monthly reporting to the insurance subcommittee. Um, in the insurance subcommittee, we were receiving any information related to insurance, insurance, but they will also be monitoring the progress of the contract to remove the filter material. So we'll be reporting monthly to that committee on the progress um, with that contract to ensure that they meet the, the contract does meet the date that they've given us. Um, we'll also be reporting to the Health and Safety Committee and the Order and Risk Committee um, as, uh, on health and safety and um, risk matters. Um, as those meetings come up, or we will have special meetings or extraordinary meetings if they're required, depending on how we're going. And um, we'll continue to um, report to um, the um, Three Waters and Environment Committee um, as it sits as well, on the just the general operations of the wastewater treatment plant alongside the other two waters. So that, um, that's our presentation. Oh, there you go. So that's that's the, um, the yellow bit of machinery with wheels. <laughs> so um, the team's here to answer any questions. Thanks very much. Um, just uh, just on the um, uh, the um, the independent health provider community meetings, we've had some. Uh, expression this morning that, that perhaps um, one of those meetings could be held in the Bromley Community Centre um, or if not an additional one to be um, added to the list. I can definitely look at all of that. Um, the reason on that facility was the, the, the space and other rooms to be able to use under stressful workshops, those things happen, but um, can definitely have a look at one for Bromley if that's required. Uh, it's been it's been really hard to hide, um, find providers um, because of the COVID situation. Everyone's really overrun with this stuff. But um, yep, we can definitely look at that. That's great. Thank you, um, Yanni. Uh, thank you, thank you for the update. I just had a few questions. Um, first off, just to start with the external um, contact with ECAN CDHB. Um, and the Medical Officer of Health. I, I was also interested to know if we've talked to NIWA or the Environmental Protection Agency and whether there's any tangible um, help or concerns that they've raised and an action plan. Because I, I got the response back to the question around what the agreed actions were and all it says is that we're just going to continue meeting. But what I really want to understand is what are the concerns that they're raising how are those concerns going to be addressed and how at a governance and a community level do we have visibility? Yeah, the, uh, the, we haven't had, as far as I'm aware, we haven't had contact with, with the likes of NIWA, um, but you know, just working with particularly the Medical Officer of Health, their, their concerns yeah, are obviously on two levels. One, one is around the toxicity issues and the other one is, is, is being addressed is, is just around the well, the welfare and the and the you know anxiety that people experience and and the testing, the very limited testing we've done so far indicates that it, the the bigger issues is, is probably around the anxiety issues rather than the stress, potential toxicity. The stress, I think, is a better word than anxiety. It's just stress. Yeah. Stress. It's okay. St it's sorry. A stressed community. Yeah. Okay. Just stressed yeah. Community. I went to say that for a start. Um, yeah. Okay. So. Yeah, Yanni, too. I, I can't offer much more than that at the moment. That that's why I've, I've got involved. We'll keep up um, very regular contact now with the Medical Officer of Health and and with ECAN, and I think we can rely on ECAN to give us more advice around the atmosphere and weather conditions as well, and try and pull all that together. And then we'll um, end up working, yeah, working closely with Katie uh, and, uh, around and Gary. Yeah, around how we how we feed that information in and and take account of people's people's stress. Thanks, thanks, Nigel. I mean, you um, and it's and thank you for for the presentation and your your role, because I mean, I think you'll recall after the earthquake, we had quite a good what I thought was quite a good um, natural 
environment recovery program where we had really clear roles and responsibilities, clear actions, timeframes to address the issues that had come up. And we worked collaboratively across organizations. So having that level of um, understanding with some sort of plan or program, I think is very useful because certainly what I've seen in the media in the last few days or the last few weeks, there's been a number of people commenting from CDHB, NIWA, um, raising concerns. And what I don't see is what the join up approach is from us working with them. Could we, so, could we ask staff to report at the next one with a very, very specific set of actions arising yeah. out of the work program? I think the DHB is different from ECAN. ECAN is the regulator, and mm. they have uh, legal responsibilities as well as the collaborative, collaborative responsibilities that they engage with us on. But uh, I, I agree with Yanni. I think it's really important that we have a front-facing view of the um, of, of what should be a um, very strong working relationship with the DHB with agreed actions and and how they are how they are tracking yeah, that, so that would be good it doesn't the, not require okay. an answer the, right now the other concern that um, people have raised to me is in terms of our odor uh, air quality monitoring and sampling is how far is that going in and measuring it at a community residential level, rather than just at the wastewater treatment site. Do you have a map of where the sites that we're monitoring air quality is or uh, are? At, at the moment, it, the we didn't put a map up for this presentation, but obviously there is one. But it, it, it's very much around the just the perimeter of the testing of the um, treatment plant at the moment, and it, it's it's going out just on the edges of the residential area, but. As time goes on and we discuss that, we'll be discussing that with particularly public health and, and also ECAN and trying to pull that um, the Smallet data together. We're, I'm sure we'll also extend further out. Having said that, um, going back to the question around toxicity, um, the, the two, as we heard Don talk about this morning, the, the two um, substances which are probably responsible for a lot of the odour is, is hydrogen sulphide, but also that uh, methyl mercaptan, which is a smell, it's had a very low level of the, that it can be detected at, um, and that's why they measure it, you know, in parts per billion, which is like one drop in a swimming pool type stuff. But it can be detected, um, so we w we will be going out. We probably will go further out and do monitoring, but it, it's probably going to show its presence rather than a risk to people's health from a toxicity issue. It'll it's more come back to that stress risk but you certainly will do, we'll have to develop that we'll be developing that and happy obviously to report back later thank you just three more questions from me um th thank you for giving us a, a brief overview of the methodology of the contract that's being let i note that the contract the contractor is working uh 12 hours a day six days a week what would it take to get them to work 24 7 and um, yeah, just keen to know um, how it could be done quicker if there was any resource that would enable it to be done seven days a week or longer hours in the day. We've got Kurt from Health and Safety to respond to that. Okay, yo. Um, the work that the contractors are gonna be undertaking is extremely dangerous and there is a lot of risk with that. Running those contractors 24 seven overnight would present a significant risk. We also have to recognise that this is an operational plant which is critical to our city's infrastructure. There are definitely labour shortages out there. The work that is undertaken is highly skilled. We would need to be very careful on any downwards pressure. This council has overlapping duties. This is our plant, this is our site and our structures. We have responsibilities under the Act to make sure that this work is done safely. So that, that's the that's the Sorry. safety issue. No, but uh, I mean, yeah. so but Kurt's not going to answer no. the so contracting in, issue. Yeah. So, so in addition to that, we um, the contractor has will have resourcing challenges. So the the contractor has been instructed to come back to us with a methodology to clean out the filter material as quickly as possible, and that's why we got from seven months down to four months. Um, his methodology. Um, 
Yeah, I'm not sure if there's anybody here that can make a comment, but the methodology in um, our professional view, not my view, the um, engineers, is that the, um, the methodology is actually delivering as quickly as is possible. Um, notwithstanding 24 hours a day would speed it up, but we have significant safety concerns, as you've heard from Kurt. Um, but the contractor also has resourcing issues and challenges, and there's a lot of construction work going on at the moment. There is not a lot of um, equipment and people available um, at the moment for the contract to bring in. So the contractor has brought in subcontractors. Um, I, I, yep. Do you want to add a little yeah. bit to that, Michael? The, but, so we, so what? We, so we've re pushed quite hard um, in terms of negotiating the contract in the first place. And there's a uh, logistic, log logistical. Um, constraints as well. So if the contract is working 24-7, um, Cape Valley is only open from uh, 7 to 3, Monday to Friday. Um, if they are pulling out that media, chipping it, compacting it, they would need to store that media on site. It's a hazardous substance, so it'll be in sealed containers. Um, the contractor is advised that if 24-7 uh, work was to commence, um, they would not have access to the containers to store that product. So um, in other words, they, they are working as quickly as they can in terms of the constraint to actually dispose of the material. But they're continuing to push for that. So that, because, um, I mean, obviously these questions were asked the other day and um, and the, the, the option of the Sunday, you know, the seven days a week, um, but they're still looking at what can be achieved. Yes, the, 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 the contractor has advised that they have a, a day and several more hours up their sleeve. If they find they're falling behind target, they can, for short periods of time, increase their working to um, seven days a week and 15 hour days, but that's not sustainable. They can't do that no. week on, week yep. out. Uh, Yanni, I'm just gonna let Sam ask a question because um, well, it's probably, associated. Yeah, it's probably more just following on from our insurance conversation the other day, just for context, Yanni, we drilled into this for about an hour. And one of the risks was, if uh, besides the logistical stuff around the 24 seven, if someone you know, unfortunately was killed out at site, we would have further delays than what we're already getting. So it's likely we'd shut the site for a couple of weeks. So, you know, plus, and it would be awful for the person. the impact on the, yeah. and the family. family. Well, <laughs> that's why I said it would be unfortunate, but there would also be another delay. So, so we did test that all out. But we did go through this in detail, but, but we haven't had an opportunity to report back. We literally met um, just last week. Friday, and um, Monday. Yeah, and so we're, we're, this is the soonest, most up-to-date information that we've got. All right. So, I mean, I question. just... So, so the idea of having some sort of alliance and having more than one contractor, that wouldn't have helped, given that we... I think we had three contractors that we were initially talking to. Yeah. Um, so from a, a procurement process, we have opted for a, um, a single and a direct appointment. Um, if we were to look at um, alternative contractors, that is an open procurement process and would have slowed us down. Um, there's also some safety um, issues with more than one contractor operating at what is quite a confined space that they will be working in. So from a safety point of view, um, we would not be promoting or supporting that from an officer point of view, but there was also a procurement issue around that. But as I said, the contractor has looked for subcontractors and has secured subcontractors um, and has secured as much resources as he can. Right. Um, my next question was just around understanding that if this was trialled in December 2021, and I've gone back and looked at the memo that we received just before the end of last year, where there was a lot of discussion around the oxidation ponds and the aerators as being a potential um, mitigation to the odour, but the tripling filter media um, although it was identified that the tripling filters weren't working at capacity, obviously not working at all, um, there wasn't much discussion around that. But given that we did the trial and it was successful, why did why did we not procure a contract then to remove it? And when did we first know that the tripling filter material would be a serious source of odour? So just in terms of the timing, so we couldn't secure a contractor until we had the insurer confirm that they were happy that we removed the material. 
So that was the start of the process to procure the contractor for this work. Um, the concentration and focus on the rest of the plant was around making sure that we had an operational plant um, and that's what, that was the focus of the project team's work um, because that was actually the immediate need to get the, uh, the, get the balance of the wastewater treatment plant um, changed so we could continue to operate that plant. So when did we first ask our insurer if we could remove the media from the trickling filters and when did they give us permission? Adrian, do you want to respond to that one? Uh, yeah, I was just finding my mute button, sorry. Um, we've been talking to them all the way through the process, um, not just around the filter media removal, but around what damage assessments and investigations were needed. And the last of the concrete samples, which was the last of the key information, was they were removed on the 21st of March and we had the approval on the 25th um, We've had to work with them and their engineers and ours to agree a scope of works effectively for what investigations were needed, then work that into all the logistics around getting people from all around the country on site, um, getting cranes and man cages to get them up there to look at that sort of thing. Um, also, protecting our position and our insurer's position with respect to other uh, parties involvement which I can't say a lot on in public but we've been going as quick as humanly possible on it. So Yanni, I just want to be I put, clear though. I put this page back up Yanni just to remind you that um, the first step in a process like this is to is the procurement process you have to hire somebody to do the job. And uh, the, um, the delegated procedure that we have in place in a matter of urgency like this led to uh, um, the decision, the approval from insurers was on a Friday, I believe, um, and it was like a week later that ELT signed off on a direct procurement subject to some additional questioning and then a final sign off on the 11th of April. And, and that way we've avoided the whole time frame that would have been involved in going out to tender. So um, there are always risks, but we have to follow the Office of the Auditor General Best Practice Guidance. And that was the consideration that the executive team uh, took into account. So um, perhaps you could direct your question to something that we haven't covered. Yeah, so what I, sorry, what I didn't get clear on is when did we suspect that the trickling filter media was going to be a serious source of odour problem. It was, it was defined as March in the last um, documentation that we had, the last briefing, um, because it was after the last, the, the first of the heavy rains and then the drying, because it's the drying immediately following heavy rain, it's hot days, or, um, that causes the rotting to occur. So, I mean, we've been briefed on this. We publicly briefed on it two weeks ago. Yeah. Okay. So, if um, just Aaron. a final, oh. final question was just around um, a state of emergency or any sort of crisis declaration. Would there be, is there any benefit to overcoming some of the challenges with um, capacity, resource, dealing with this um, massive issue? If, if we considered a state of emergency or any as sort of the chair declaration. Of the joint, as the chair of the Joint Committee on equipment. Civil Defence and Emergency Management, I can tell you that answer in one word, and that is no. Aaron. Yeah, just, and thank you for putting that journey back up. Um, the approval from insurers was on the 25th of March. Why was the convert, so just, because people in public will ask this, why was the conversation not made with the contractors prior to that? So once approval was given, they would have been rolling in somewhere in before the end of March and starting work. Like when you go to do a own development, you go to the, you're going to the bank, you know you're not getting the num thing from the bank, but you've lined up all the ducks prior to that. Um. 
I don't know, Adrian, if you want to make a comment here. But, um... Sorry, I was just distracted by kids running in and out of the room. Could you just repeat the question? Same, Adrian. Um, <laughs> the, uh... it's, not, it's not really an insurance question, um, but could staff have gone and talked to contractors before they'd made a decision to directly well, engage? Well, the, yeah, the, the conversation with insurance had been going on for quite some time and a lot of work was being done, but the, what, why were the contractors not lined up to start the, as soon as approval was given? So you have approval, then you bring in the contractors. No, because a decision has to be made as to what procurement model will be adopted. And the, the organisation... <laughs> Uh, couldn't really make a decision or a call on the procurement model until they had the go-ahead from the insurer. Or are you suggest? Well, maybe that's yes. the question. Yes. So, so we could need. The, yeah. Could staff have considered the procurement model earlier? Um, only theoretically. We needed to know what we were procuring before we actually went out and started talking to, well, considering a procurement process and talking to contractors. So we had to be very careful. Um, ahead of making a procurement decision not to talk to one contractor because that decision hadn't been made. But we didn't even know what we were procuring. So just to remind everyone, this was a um, an event that has got no precedent that we could have learnt from. So we have been learning um, as we go. So with the benefit of hindsight, and we will do a, you know, a, a look back, there could have been decisions that we made differently. But remember, we were we when we we weren't we weren't making decisions on any past experience. But my my question is around because the bit that the public really care about is the smell and the removal of the material. How long the rebuild part takes and who, who pays for what and how it's done isn't such a big deal because they know it will be done and done well. Uh, but it's that interim smell part that was. The expectation was that was always going to be removed, no matter what replaced it or was going to be repaired or be done. So why was that part, the removal of that, not set up earlier? So on the, let's even be generous, the 27th of March, they could have started rolling in and we had the photo op and we're into it. Our, our, our initial concerns were the odours coming from the ponds and it wasn't till later that we became aware that the odours from the trickling filters were causing an issue um, or were, became an issue. Um, so mo most of staff's time and efforts were going into making sure we could get the ponds in order um, and eliminate the smell from there. So by the time the trickling fil odours from the trickling filters, or we became aware of the odour odor from the trickling filters, matches more or less up with when the insurers um, said we could then start removing that media. So pr prior to that, removing the media that, that, wasn't as big that a rush. That could be true, but it, there was a number of, because like, I grew up very close to there, and prior to the lids being on years ago and stuff, we used to smell the sewer farms all the time and my uncle lived right next to Cal Stadium. And uh, and so that was a different smell. So locals knew the smell, they know the, the sewer farm smell and that wasn't what they were picking up. So alarm bells must have been going off earlier. So can I just get Elizabeth just to give you a bit of a Thank advice as well? It's just as a practical matter, and Jane already alluded to it, um, if we had gone out and because we needed the right contractor to do the job. The, the reason you do a direct appointment is in cases of emergency and so on. But you also need to know that you are going to the right person to do the job for you. Otherwise, you do go through that procurement process. Until we knew exactly what we needed to be done, we didn't, you know, it's hard to preempt who you need to do the job until you know what the job is. And yes, there are lots of <coughs> contractors out there who could do it, but once we'd fully ascertained what it was that we were looking at and what we needed to, to do, it made sense to go out there. And sometimes if you, you know, more hastily speed, sometimes if you make decisions without exactly knowing what it is you're going out for, what is your scope, what is all the rest of it, you don't know if you've got the right fit until you know what you need. Can, question. I mean, I also want you, to, perhaps while you're at the table, and I'm going to get Adam to come back, because I think that from a technical point of view, he might be um, in a position to respond to that. But um, Elizabeth, do you want to just respond to the obligations that we have to the insurer, uh, not to undermine any claims that they might have? The, a lot of us have dealt with insurance, you know, in, 
and Christchurch with no insurance well. You have noted that. So as an organisation, it's not just our obligations to the insurer, it's our obligations to the ratepayer to make sure that we handle this insurance policy properly. If it's not handled properly, that has a, that can potentially have a significant impact on the ratepayers. Well, the insurer could actually um, void the contract mm -hmm. if we do anything yes. that undermines mm -hmm. their position. And thank you. That's, and that, that's, the, that's yeah. the unfortunate that is the gist of reality. And if, people, I think, know that because yeah. that's the, their own personal experience. Yeah, and if we, if we step out of the, we have an excellent relationship with the insurer, and if we had stepped out of that, and if we had done anything without full discussions with them and approval from them, we potentially will always run the risk of jeopardising some or all of um, whatever settlement or payment could be made. So then we must have had the, because we always knew the media had to come out, that stuff had to come out at some point anyway, did we, and, and I totally respect that those negotiations were going on, and it's great that they, with the insurance, that n no breaches were made, so we will get our proper insurance. But we must have had the opportunity to ask the insurance companies for permission, or and all three of them, whoever's un reinsuring whoever else, to say, hey, look, We've got a real stench problem in this area. Can we have permission to get that part sorted earlier prior to the other stuff being done? So just um, saying again, it wasn't till March that we realised that the stench from the trickling filters was, was a problem. So we were dealing with the smell from the rest of the plant and the, the ponds. It was March when we had the weather conditions that then generated those really intense stench issues. So up till then, we weren't aware that that was going to happen. So there wasn't a lot of time between those weather conditions giving rise to that stench and the insurer approving the, um, the works. So w were we not receiving reports earlier? I, I thought I'd s smelt it through the Christmas no, break. No, that, no that's, you would have that was the, the I... point that was right. made at the public briefing and, and Helen Beaumont went out to the community and did a briefing explaining what we were going to do in relation to the ponds. So, and it was the aerators and the and turning whatever it was, those other bits into, into aerating ponds. So, Helen, do you want to just update on that? One, one of the things with um, fortnightly briefings is that we tend to talk to you about what's happened in the last two weeks and what's happening in the next two weeks, and we forget that it's been several weeks since the fire. Now, immediately after the fire, the smell was the burnt plastic media, and that was pretty gross across the whole city. And the fire knocked out some of our air handling systems, so we were also getting a lot of odours from the primary treatment part of the plant. So where we screen the wastewater, um, where our primary sedimentation tanks are, was um, without any air handling at all. So it took us three weeks to get a temporary air handling system online there. So we had multiple sources of odour from right across the plant. The other thing that happened in those few weeks <coughs> after the fire and through the warmest period of the summer is that the fire itself took all of the oxygen out of that wastewater stream and it destroyed the media, the biological <coughs> media and the treatment process in those um, secondary contact tanks. So we got a lot of odours from that area as well. That has, over the past few weeks, come all the way back to ordinary operation and we're not getting odours from those anymore. But I think the, the thing is that over the weeks we've had multiple sources of odour and the dominant odour has shifted from one part of the plant to another. So we've been playing chase, if you like, um, trying to get rid of the worst ones as soon as possible, and we're doing that. And now... Where we're playing chase is the trickling filters. But we have already eliminated odours from other parts or minimised them. So there's a lot of work that's happened and a lot of odour sources that we've got on top of. And now we're dealing with the ponds by continuing to improve the process and the trickling filters by getting rid of that media. So, so, so it's just a little potted history because we tend to forget um, what's happened several weeks ago. So when, just to be really clear, when we... Because we are, 
we are all aware that there's a lot of constraints around infrastructure build and stuff at the moment and, and getting contractors of any sort. When we started our insurance um, discussions and lodged our insurance claim, did we also start our procurement process at that point, knowing it would be longer than normal? We lodged our insurance claim on the 2nd of November last year. Yep. You, so no, we, we didn't. Yeah, yeah, to get the, the, the stuff out, because at that point it was we the We didn't bad know that there was a problem with the media smell yeah. as above all of the other smells that were going on at the same time. I think that's what... Yeah, so um, what Helen we've been doing, yeah, we've been dealing with the priorities. So um, that wasn't a priority at that time. So no, we did not begin that work. What, what is... Yeah, I think what he's saying though, aren't you, is on the, the day we applied for permission for the insurer to remove the media, did we also start the procurement work? Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. Oh, so you're not talking about the day we filed the claim? No. no. Um, well, we, we started seek permission? to investigate the procurement options at that point. So the, the question that you're asking is, could the organisation... And is it a lesson learned that we should have started that process earlier? And that's something that we should take um, on, on notice and, and, and come back. Um, could we have started earlier on the procurement process? Could the organisation have made the determination to go to a single procurement um, uh, earlier? That, that, that's the question, because otherwise it would have been an open tender or a closed tender. Um, amongst a limited group, so yeah. Well, no, no, no. Let's let's take it offline. We're not going to ask and answer the question here. We're, we're going to ask the question here. We're not going to answer it here. So that is the question: is could that is that a lesson learned that we could have started the procurement process earlier by making the decision to go with a single contractor earlier? Because um, we certainly couldn't have gone to public tender. Um, any earlier than the agreement from the insurance company exactly. to um, allow the removal, regardless of whether it was a reinstatement or a rebuild, because it's that, that question still sits as an unanswered question. We don't know if the um, out, outward structure is sufficiently damaged to require a rebuild or whether it's repairable. Yep. All right. Um, Adam, did you want to come back and add to anything there? Oh, you were there. <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry. Um, sorry. The, the only thing I wanted to add is obviously when the fire took out the trickling fills on the first on the first of November, it took out a significant treatment process. The site was always going to smell after that, regardless of where it came from. We lost a significant treatment process. So whether that unit smell or the unit's down cell smell, we were always going to be trying to chasten it to find out where it is. At the time, for the first two and a bit months, the trickling filters didn't smell because they weren't getting wet. We didn't know how far the fire went down into the media um, and what, what was left. Yeah. So, I mean, it, uh, I mean, it took three weeks to put the fire out, I think. Exactly. Correct. So, yeah. I mean, it's, th 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 this will all be documented. Um, we will do a lessons learned review. We always do after events such as this. Um, and uh, one of the one of the lessons learned has been the the need for external communications right from the get go. We did that really well. Omicron intervened, and I think we 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 didn't do as well as we could have. And that's a big lesson learned. But very much focused now on outward facing communications. Um, all right, uh, questions. Um, I've got Jake and then Phil. Um, so just clarifying, uh, when we realised that the, the really bad uh, source of the odour was the media, and that was March, and it was within a month that we got the go-ahead to proceed to remove that media, uh, and given that the media obviously smelled incredibly bad immediately after the fire, was it assumed that that smell would simply go away, or... So well, I don't know why we wouldn't seek to, yes, do the ponds, but also to address the media and seek approval as quickly as possible to remove the media as well, even if it wasn't the predominant source of odour. So the initial smell after the fire from the trickling filters was the burnt plastic media smell, which then dissipated over time. And then with it being dry, 
it didn't smell for a couple of months. Right. So okay. different. So it's a different odor from the same source, essentially. Correct. Yes. Okay. Uh, Phil. Thank you, uh, Adam. I'm, I'm going to bounce around on a whole lot of questions here, um, and and to Jane. Did, did we actually ask the insurance company if our claim would be compromised if we if we went earlier? Adrian, that's probably a question for you. Um, to say you, if you touch this, all bets are off. Is that oh, did they hold us to ransom? Is what I'm sort of trying to say. Uh, Short answer is no, they've been quite receptive going forward, going from the start on requests from us. Um, in terms of, as the Mayor just pointed out, we, we're not sure on the status of the concrete tanks. That was the biggest question all along. So um, they've been okay with us doing various things on and around the site on the understanding that we avoid wherever possible uh, having an impact on the tanks um, and the whole uh, testing regime has been done in accordance with them and to meet both sides of needs and take into account the fact that that's the key question we need answered. So the, what, what I'm getting at is if, if and correct me if I'm wrong, we haven't actually decided that the tank is going to be demolished yet. We don't know that yet, do we? No. We're not at that point. No, that's okay. right. So whether the tanks are demolished or not, the media had to come out separately in my view. You could have pulled the side down, but you don't need to contaminate all the media with concrete because the weight of the concrete, it, it would be a nightmare to try and do it like that. So I feel the way from, from the 25th of March on, everything's gone along like a freight train. It's been absolutely good. And... Before then, we were doing a lot of work on the aerators, and I commend you guys for that. It's fantastic because that's what we're good at, looking after the smell from um, sewage. But we didn't. I don't think that we put enough um, thought or looked in our rear mirror to see this quietly building smell coming up behind us that has now slapped us in the back of the head. But anyway... So can I just be really clear? We didn't know that the tanks were intact... And so we didn't know, and we still don't, but we certainly didn't have any results from any of the testing of the concrete um, to indicate whether they were intact or not. So I don't think it's correct to say that we've always known that we were going to take the media out separately and weren't going to demolish the tanks. Okay, right, I'll move on to another question. Just with, you talked about ooh, sheet piling, and is that to contain the gravel that's going in to make the ramp, I assume? Yes, that's right. Okay, yeah, cool. <laughs> um, have, have, and you won't be able to tell me this either, <laughs> have we got a fixed price off the contract or, or is it open-ended? I, I, I mm. don't know whether that's an appropriate um, public conversation for us to be having at the moment, but I don't know. No, no so we haven't absolutely finalised the contract, the details of the whole, whole, all the details of the contract, so at this point we won't be disclosing that information. Fair enough. No, that's fine. Okay. Uh, uh, yep, yep. No, that's fine. Thank you very much. Right. Jimmy Chen. Thank you for your uh, presentation. One of the slides you mentioned of what deliver in four packets. Baseline plus three packets of options. I just want to know whether has any the kind of time frame more oh. certainty. So that's um that's looking at the replacement yes. option. So um so we've um awarded a contract to a consultant, they will be reporting back in November yes. with the options, the assessment of the options, and um, as Michael said, the consideration of a future a regulatory regime which might mean that we're not discharging to the ocean treated, treated wastewater. So November is the, the date that we expect to have that report. Thank you. The other one questions regarding the kind of Share 
to my right, the EKCDHD or some other the amino acids and the also the affected amino group, etc. Who will inform all those people? Just independent community organizers today, they don't go, you know, pick one. Or is council take the lead to, to, to coordinate? So the meeting, yeah, the meeting tomorrow night, as um, John said this morning, is a community-led um, initiative. Yeah, so it's the community that has called their own meeting. They have invited us to attend. And there's a meeting for hours. We not our to... meeting. It's not our meeting, but we've been invited to attend. Um, based on what might be said tomorrow night yes. and, and the need, we could look at, at hosting our own community meeting. So that's not off the table. Yes. We, we'll wait and um, talk to you next week about that. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Right. So the um, motion before us is that we receive the information on this update. So I'll move that. Do I have a seconder? Pauline? Is there any discussion? Oh, Phil? <laughs> Just checking. Okay, no, 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 no. I, I, it's one thing I feel, which, which is good, the best thing that has happened now is people can, after the fire, people were driving past until the 25th of March, and we, they saw us working on things, but they didn't see anything happening on the trickle filters, and that was what was making him disappointed. If we'd been doing something, I feel we wouldn't be quietly in the... Um, bit of mess and drama that we're in at the moment. But I, I, I don't quite understand. Yanni asked the question uh, about a state of emergency, like after the uh, earthquakes, we had a state of emergency and we fixed things and we could just get on ahead and do it straight away. I can't understand why we didn't do that back then, which would have maybe freed up the staff to be able to go and do the direct appointments and all that sort of thing without having to worry about going through the process of um, what they've had to go to, and, and I, I just feel that we we could have moved a lot earlier. I'm sorry to say. Um, yep, and that's about it. Thank you. Thank you, Yanni. Thank you. Um, I want to acknowledge first off that it's really good to be getting these updates, and I know staff said that they would provide them on a regular basis, and that often the written update would be. Um, behind the verbal update that was given. So obviously today staff have given even more information. I hope that there's opportunity through the discussions with the contractor not to just um, use the extra day and hours if they're falling behind the target, but to actually try and aim for a quicker target rather than um, just use it as a makeup. Obviously we've got an insurance subcommittee and um, other staff members who are directly involved in dealing with the contractor. But I just wanted to signal that, you know, after the earthquake with the skirt repairs, we used an alliance to get stuff done quicker than the traditional model, and it worked quite well. And if there's any ability to source additional capacity for, for our contractor to supplement the work that they're doing, then I think we need to be looking at all of those options. Because although it's appreciated that September is a lot better than um, the end of the year, it's still a heck of a long time for people to have to put up with the odour. The other point that I want to make really clearly is that while I appreciate that there is a concern about the costs associated to the ratepayers, there's also the obligation to our communities in Bromley, in Avonside, in Wollston, in Aranui Wainoni, who are dealing with these awful um, effects of the odour both from a health point of view and, and a, uh, a, a stress and an anxiety point of view. And I think we do absolutely, as a city, have obligations to the health and well-being of our citizens and our communities that actually outweigh the, the cost of doing something to get the problem solved as soon as possible. So, you know, the, at the end of the day, um, I previously have asked the question, is there anything that we would be doing if the money wasn't an obstacle and I've been reassured last week that no, this is not about money. This is about logistics and resources and capacity rather than any concern for um, the cost. So I hope that that continues going forward because we do need to get the trickling filters 
uh, media removed as soon as we can. I am concerned about some of the methodology that I've heard about um, building things up to the top rather than going through. Um, but I think the other thing is to acknowledge that the community have a meeting tomorrow and that the social support briefing that we get on Tuesday, I just hope that that will be able to be made public as soon as possible because people are waiting to know what the support is that we are going to give to the most impacted people. And the sooner that we can be public and transparent about that, then I welcome having those conversations. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie, and then Anne. Um, look, I understand where Yanni is coming from, and I know that people are frustrated. Um, but I personally think that what we've heard today has showed um, that the council staff and, and all the contractors and everyone involved has put an awful amount of work into this and an awful amount of thought. And I, I, they maybe could have done a little bit better here and there, possibly, but I really actually can't see it. And I think they've answered all of our questions very clearly and shown exactly what they've been doing and the work that we don't know about. And it actually makes me upset to think that we don't seem to appreciate it. But um, I think the safety of the people working on this is paramount. And if we can't work any faster, we can't work any faster. And I don't think there are health effects of the, you know, what's being produced from, from the wastewater treatment plant itself. There may be, but I don't think that there probably are. That's what we've been hearing. Um, I think the stress is obviously clear on everyone involved, including us. But, um, yeah, I actually wanted to give the staff a round of applause. Yeah, I think, um, thank you, Mel. I think the uh, point's been made several times that this has been an unprecedented event and no rule book. And so what we've heard this, uh, this, this morning is how hard and fast the team have been working to, to get this sorted. And, you know, once again, we have an example of the, the depth and the width of the expertise on, uh, in our council team. And the responses from staff have been exhaustive and reassuring. So I would like to also um, express my appreciation for the work being done. I think, as always, the key question is what um, is our council's role in terms of the well-being issue. And I think we are now, um, we are acknowledging the distress. Um, we are understanding, we're beginning to understand the nature of that, dis that distress. We're identifying what council can do in partnership with um, the community NGOs that are already there, that people trust. And we will find out the best way to get the support that's needed to them in the quickest and most efficient way. And tomorrow night's meeting will be useful because we'll, we'll hear from the community exactly what they need. So once, along with, with all of us, I'm sure, just want to also um, express my appreciation for the work done. Thank you. Uh, Pauline? Yeah, well, I was pretty much going to um, say exactly that, Anne, in your wise words, that no precedent for this. And it's easy to look back and, and say, yeah, that we, maybe we could have done that a bit better. You know, hindsight is a wonderful thing. But um, it... It's just simply a reality that this has been an evolving, unfolding course of events. And I think that the staff have really done brilliantly in um, compiling really, really good, interesting, detailed information for people. This is what they want, really detailed stuff. And, and I'm really pleased to see that today and in the previous reports that we've had as well. And also that we're going to have regular reports like this. They're just receiving reports, so um, I think that's a really good idea. And I think the fact that we've now, local residents have got this timeline now, 16 weeks. And I believe that as that media comes out, the odour will gradually reduce over that 16 weeks. It may, may be a little bit worse in the beginning and then it should reduce, I believe. So um, I think having that timeline is going to give people possibly, hopefully, the strength to get through to that end date. So I want to reiterate the thanks as well for all the work on this as well. Sarah, then Tim. Um, once again, reiteration of thanks um, to staff for the enormous amount of work they've done under a huge amount of pressure, both from council laws who have been on their backs um, constantly and um, from the community who are rightly distressed by um, the extent of the odour. Um, while it is really tempting 
to want to go in and fix things straight away and do whatever we can so that we can show we're doing something. What's also really, really clear is that um, blundering in without the backing of the advice from experts could have seen us in a, mate, in a, in a much greater mess um, than is currently underway. Thank you. Okay, uh, Tim. Um, thank you. I don't know how many people around this table have been responsible for crews working in a high risk environment, mm -hmm. but you know, twelve days, uh, sorry, twelve hours a day, six days a week in a high risk environment is always um, um, a concern, especially when you're doing your um, health and safety assessments, etc. So um, I want to thank the staff for coming up with that, and also the um, contract and working together to um, try and maintain, and I'm sure you will maintain. Um, the safest possible work environment for these crews and um, if it has to slow down or take a gap because fatigue in a high risk environment six days a week 12 hours a day is always a concern for those running the crews so um, you've done a great job it's now time to get on with it and I hope we just leave you guys alone to get on with it and the other update would be great thank you thank you uh, Celeste Aaron I don't think there's a huge amount left to say, but I just also want to briefly um, acknowledge the impact on residents and communities, particularly in the east. It has been a very distressing um, situation, and you know I think that um, I'm really pleased that now we've got some certainty moving forward. I think that really helps a lot in terms of understanding what the next steps are. Like others, I also want to acknowledge the role um, in the hard work of staff. Um, I think it's easy to pose solutions but to deliver on those is incredibly difficult. And I mean, this was a catastrophic event that has had to be managed in a pandemic. <laughs> so it's, it's a pretty unusual situation. And um, I'm just focused on what the next steps are moving forward in a positive way. Uh, Aaron? Um, yeah, I, a couple of things. I'm a little bit, I mean, I'm very grateful that we've got to where we've got to today. Uh, that's, that's a good point moving forward. Um, I think I do believe we could have got here quicker um, and a lot of people have said thank you to the staff I certainly don't disagree with that um, but I want to say thank you to the people that live out there and live near this because they're putting up with something for the rest of our city that really most people couldn't put up with um, uh, maybe about six weeks ago I remember driving around the ring road with my kids we were on our way to work and um, we had the windows down because it was quite warm and uh, one of my sons said, what the hell is that? Um, and just could not fathom the smell. Uh, we live in Herewood. Uh, this doesn't reach Herewood very well. I, no, I'm not aware of it actually reaching Herewood. But often coming through town, going over the overbridge by the skate park, you'd pick it up there when it wafts across. Um, so the people on that side of town have put up with something just unfathomable for those that don't live it or experience it and let's never lose sight of that these um every single one of them is um putting up with something that uh, no one should have to put up with uh so the sooner this can be done the better i am a little dubious around the timelines uh because uh there, there are people watching online um i'm a member of the bromley group uh chat and once that question was asked before, they're putting up that they were reporting it in December and through to January. Some gave up in January. Um, I do recall it myself in January after the big rain drop we had in January. And let's not forget there was a really big rain dump. I'm, I'm going to go with the 15th of December. There was we had a, around that date. There's a really big one. So it's interesting that people are coming up on on that chat saying the 17th and 18th of December and stuff was the date they started reporting it. So um, I will just put that into the public domain here that people are making counterclaims to what's being said at this table and let's be mindful of them because they're the ones that are living with the worst of it. They have to live with it 24 hours a day if they're home all the time and so, some of them are lucky enough to go to work on the other side of town to get relief. Um, and, uh, and so let's always be mindful of them as well. And thank you to the staff that do all their hard work. Thank you. Um... In my column today, I um, publicly apologised um, for the for the fact that we really didn't do good enough, well enough, getting the information out to people. Um, and it, you know, it, I've acknowledged that it's a catastrophic fire of enormous proportions, and there's been a massive job going on behind the scenes, but we didn't front foot the. 
the, the showing of the what was going on behind the scenes. And, uh, and I regret that um, and I've apologised for that. Um, the commitment that we're making with these regular reports, front-facing, either at council meetings or at finance and performance meetings, is, is to ensure that we are constantly keeping um, the very people that have been referred to, the residents who are affected um, by this dreadful, dreadful um, stench that arises in particular around the, 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 the days um, that we've, we've described. And I think that um, with, with that in mind, uh, we will ensure that people are kept regularly up to date. Uh, the invitation uh, from the community to attend their, their public meeting tomorrow night has been um, well received by us as councillors and, uh, and by staff, and, um, and that, will be, be, w w that will enable us to be talking directly um, with people as we did before Christmas. So the, the, the way that we approach things before Christmas, um, that was the way to go. After Christmas and Omicron and the risk around public meetings, um, it meant that there wasn't that, that update. And so this is an opportunity to set things um, back on track. When we started this uh, contracting process, the early estimates saw this stretching out until the end of the year. And now we can expect the work to be completed by early spring. That's a massive, um, uh, well, it's a significant improvement on where we were. And the biggest message that I've been receiving from people is that, tell us, tell us what's happening, tell us when it will be done. And um, so now we have some certainty around that and we have set up the structures so that we've got the insurance subcommittee meeting between council and finance and performance. We've got um, sort of that ongoing um, focus, and you know the, the and and we will ensure that there are better ways of communicating with people, and um, it doesn't require an unprecedented event to know that that is that is absolutely bottom line in every case. So on that note, I will put the. Um, I'll put the um, motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. That is carried. Thank you very much. And thank you very much to the entire team who has put this presentation together. Um, it is hugely appreciated, not just by councillors, but by the community as well. Um,